I want to talk to you for a short while this morning. It's good to see you back from your journeys. Absolutely. She's back with us this morning. All right, let's go now. I want to talk to you on this subject called Keys of Success. Uh, I have so many keys of success because I've, I've, I've taught leadership for years and I've got so many. But every now and then the Lord, Lord will bring two or three up and say, we need you to talk on that this morning. So I want to bring this to your attention. We're going to read you from the scriptures and this will be from Deuteronomy chapter 30 and from verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. Now here's what the word says. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this against you. In other words, he says, God says, I'm going to make a statement and I want heaven to record it and I want earth to record it that this is what I said and this is what I mean. He said, here's what, here's what he says, heaven and earth will record this. I have set before you, oh, listen, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose, you choose which it is you want what path you'll run. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursings. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed, that your children and your children's children, may have life. And the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John to have life in abundance. That you may love the Lord with all the Lord your God. And that you may obey his voice. And then that you may cleave unto him, for he is your life. And, the la and, and he also is your length of days, that you may dwell long in the land that the Lord sweareth unto your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Now let's understand some biblical principles. There is a correlation between your heart and your mouth. You got to line the two up. The word of God works if you'll speak it. The Bible tells us we've got to believe it in our heart first. We got to believe what it says. We got to believe that it's for us. We've got to believe it was written, signed, and sealed in the name of Jesus for us in this lifetime. Then we got to speak it, the correlation between our heart and between our mouth. One of them doesn't work. You can't have unbelief in your heart and speak in this sight and get it from God, nor can you just believe it in your heart and not talk it and get it. It doesn't work that way. There's the two in combination brings life to the fore. You've got to believe it, and you've got to learn how to say it. Salvation, for instance, for you to get born again this morning, you've got to understand, you've got to believe with your heart. You've got to believe with your heart. Then the Bible says you've got to make confession or you've got to speak it out with your mouth in order, in order to do it. It's not enough just to believe. It's not enough just to believe. You've got to actually verbally speak it out. You've got to hear yourself say it. I learned over the years in reading the Scriptures and I read them and I read them and I read them. And when I read them and I see something, uh, it's, you know you can read a passage of Scripture a hundred times and read it the next time and see something. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you see it, I, I underline mine. Sometimes I've got a notebook, uh, I, I, I've note, I've, I've places full of notebooks. I like to get the Scripture that I've just seen that just was alive to me and I rewrite it. I write it out. Now, you may not have this means, but I got computer, two, two, two computers work when I'm studying. And I'll look up the Hebrew and I'll look up the Greek. I'll look it up in different translations if that word's saying something to me. I want to make sure I drain it, get everything out of it, but I'll write it down. But even if I didn't write it down, I wasn't in that place to write it down. Here's what I'd do. I'd read it out loud for myself. You don't have to shout it from the rooftops, but you've got to hear it. And when you read it and you see it, just smile to yourself and say, that's mine, that's mine. I'm going to be blessed in the city. I'm going to be blessed in the field. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lend and I'll never have to borrow again. You've got to say what the Word says and hear yourself say it. He says, choose. You've got to make a choice. Choose life. Choose life. Choose not to be depressed. Choose to get out of the situation you're in. Choose to live long and prosper. Choose to be in a better environment that you're in. Choose. He says, I set before you the opportunities, both that and this, and blessing and curse. He says, now you make the choice. It now, he says, I've done the groundwork. I've set it before you. Now it's entirely up to you. You make the choice. You make the statements, and then you go after it. There's nothing automatic about this. You have got to work it. In fact, the book of James chapter 3, wonderful passage of Scripture. I actually thought about preaching this instead, but James chapter 3, it tells you about how the whole thing works. And he gives you three examples. He says, like, we have a horse, and, we, and if we want that mass, you ever seen the size of a horse? Those things are huge. 
you got to get a step ladder to get up on top of it. They're massive. They're a real beast. And let me tell you something. Hey, here's what he says. You know how we can lead that about? If a horse decides it's not going anywhere, you, you could pull all day and it's not moving. So he says we put a small metal bit in its mouth. And then we pull the reins different ways and the horse can be led about. Now he's talking about the way you speak and, and, and how you speak. He says it guides you. It'll guide you. You can steer life. You can steer life like you can steer a horse with that little bit of metal in the mouth. He's, of course, talking about a tongue. He said it's like a ship, those massive cruise liners, that they go through the storms and tornadoes and hurricanes and all types of things, but they end up at their destination. And what gets them there is a little bit of a rudder, a little bit of metal at the back. And the captain, it doesn't matter if he's short, fat, hurry, or bold. It doesn't matter if he's 16 or 60. He can take that cruise ship wherever he wants by steering that little bit of metal at the back. He says, here it is with you. If you learn how to steer your tongue, you make the choices. I've said it before you. You make the choice. And it doesn't matter the size of the storm, how long the storm. It doesn't matter what they say, experts says or whatever. You can change the course. You can change the course by the words of your mouth. He goes on near the end of the passage and talks about a, ch a tongue setting the world on fire. Now, I know it could be used, and probably would be used in a, in, a, in a very negative terminology, that with gossip, et cetera, saying the wrong things, and you can put fire in the things. But let me tell you, in a positive sense, you can fire yourself up. Look at somebody say, that's what I need. I fire myself up with the Word of God. I tell myself what God says. And when you hear yourself saying what God says, it'll put fire back on the inside of it. In other words, what you believe and what you say will activate your world. He said, I've said it before you. Why are you sitting and going through the same rigmarole? Why you say you have nothing left and you're broken, you're going nowhere? When I have said it before you, you choose. And come out of this wherever you are. Um, years and years ago, in, in teaching in leadership in, in, a, in another uh, uh, place, I was a Bible school, and they said to me, would you teach on the subject uh, the, on principles of success? I said, oh, well, surely. They said, we want you to take your life as an example and what you think you did to make your life work. In other words, how you got to where you are right now. I said, yeah, I can do it. So I went back into the room, and I said, Holy Spirit, how did I get where I am today? <laughs> could you tell me sh four short principles that I could teach this bunch? And he said, why don't he give it to me real quick? I want to give you those short principles this morning. They will work for you. These are uh, universal. They will work. The first one is this. Write this down somewhere. It's called the giving that I do. The giving that I do. Not the giving that I did because I still give. I'm still a giver. Laura and I are born again belie uh, believing in givers. We are givers. And let me tell you straight off, let me tell you as tithing works. We have proved it down in the last 42 years of life. We have proved it that tithing, tithing works. When you first begin, you may not actually see the produce of it straight away, but the longer you keep doing it, suddenly you look back and you'll say, wow, look where we are now. You'll see God turning up in the strangest and the most wonderful and the most fantastic uh, places and the ma fantastic ways. And what I learned over the years ago as an adventurer in Jesus, I don't want to be a boring Christian. I want adventure. And where I found the greatest adventure was in giving. If you learn how to hear from God and give, it puts you out in a limb many times. But there's an adventure. And oh Lord, when the increase comes back and the sudden thing, and it comes back and it shows up, you'll suddenly know God heard, God saw, God watched over, and all of a sudden you're on and you'll say, God, let's do that again. So I was a tither. We have been tithers. We are tithers. And God rebukes the devourer on our behalf, according to Malachi. He re rebukes the, 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 the devourer. That devour will come into your house. Your car will break down. Your, the, your house will flood. You think I've got a little nest egg here and I'm going to save this for a rainy day. It'll thunder and lightning on you in a second if you're not tithing because the devour will come in and snatch that out of you. You'll not know where your money went. It'll come in one way and you'll say, where did that go? But it has no productive uh, uh, properties to it until you give God his portion. But after that, I learned about giving, about offerings. And after years of watching and listening, and, and listening to preachers and finding in the Word, I found out that you can make your, your sowing, you can make your, your offerings work for you. 
you can sow, you can sow specifically for se several reasons. You could sow concerning things. I called it targeted giving. In other words, if I, had, I wanted to do something, wanted to go somewhere, needed this, but I didn't have the money, and many's the time we hadn't, then we would take how much is that and we would give towards that. We would maybe give the tithe of it or what, and find out when we give this, then this money would start to come in. So we had targeted giving. Let me tell you something. Your giving opens doors for future projects. What you're doing now is you're sowing in your tomorrows. You're sowing for your journeys and in your trips. When you bless a missionary, let me tell you all you're doing is setting your mission up. When you need to go somewhere, God will have it there for you. You'll sow for your future projects. Luke 6, 38 says, If you give, it shall be given back unto you. But before you get it, it's increased, it's multiplied. The King James says it's yeah, it's it's, it's given back to you in good measure. In other words, it's pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. God said that. I didn't say it. He said that. He said, if you give, I will see that it's increased. Whatever you give, I'll see that it's increased, multiplied, blessed, and I'll give it back to you. Shall men, somebody out there has got my money. Look at somebody say, have you got the pastor's money? Somebody out there has got the increase of you. There, let me help you here. You've been tithing, you've been giving for years and saw little in return. Don't you know that your heavenly bank account has been stacked up with your finances of your giving over the years? You've just never made a collection on it. You need to make a Holy Ghost collection and say, I need this finances and call how much you need and say, money come to me in Jesus' name because I made that deposit, I sowed that and watch money come to you, for you and through you. Understand this concerning your giving. Absolutely nothing goes unnoticed in the kingdom of God. The smallest amount, the greatest amount. An earring, a hairband, a pair of shoes, a t-shirt. No matter what it is, if you give, let me tell you something, it never goes unnoticed. That person you give it to may not even turn around and say, Danke schön and thank you. and uh, They may not even smile. In fact, they'll just take it, snatch it, put it in the pocket and walk off. It doesn't matter. God saw it. Look at somebody say, God saw it. When you understand that you will know you can never be stolen from again. You cannot be stolen from. Because if somebody took it, what you do is just say, I'll give it to them. And you, you've lost it anyway, but whatever it was, it now becomes a seed that's sown. And if it's a seed that's sown, it will increase, multiply, and come back to you. Look at somebody say, I'm on a winner. I'm on a winner. Absolutely. You've got to understand this this morning. Your giving will open doors to you, and it will come back to you, not just in a time of need. It will come in a time of need. But have you been specifically sowing for something? Your heart's there, you're watching it, you're believing for it. It will come, and then you'll get to do what you wanted to do or go wherever you needed to go. You cannot outgive God. If you give, the Bible says, I promise you, I will give it back to you, increased. Shall men give back unto your bosom? Let me tell you, if you've given, God will say to it that that scripture comes alive to you. It will come back in Jesus' name. You may not, you don't even know where that, when you give that money, you don't know where it's going to end up. You don't know what it's going to do. God knows. God knows. Some people say, oh, I'll give it to you, but I need to know now what's happening with that. It's none of your business. When you give it to God, God will take it. He will multiply it. You'll still get the increase. You don't know how far that finances will go in somebody's life. You don't know what, what help it will be to somebody at that time of need. You don't know how many people that, that finances you that will reach. We, Laura and I already give to three separate missions. Three separate missions. It comes the end of the month and I've got to give that out. Sometimes I don't have hardly enough. And sometimes I'm saying, God, you're going to have to give me. That's another that I have to give out to them. And sometimes I can turn around and say, hold on a minute. I got my own bills here. But I've got this first. I need to give. Because if I give, my increase will come. You've got to learn these things. Somebody once described it like this. You can count the seeds in an apple. If I had an apple, I'd thought about bringing one, but I didn't. And cut the apple open, a few seeds will fall out onto your table. You can count the seeds in the apple, but you can't count the apples that's in the seed. When you plant that seed and it becomes a tree, I don't know how many apples will come in that, in that tree's lifetime. You can count the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count those apples inside the seed. And 
it's the same with your money. When you give, small or large, specifically or whatever, when you give, let me tell you, there's a major increase will come back, to, not just to you, but God can get to do what he wants to do with it. In other words, I learned this a long time ago. You, I used to say, we're broke. Have you ever said that? <laughs> Sometimes I would really make a deal and say, hey, Laura, it's official. We're really broke. Used to be when you're broke, you'd still have money somewhere, but there's times it was official and you'd no money anywhere. And I used to say I was broke, but I realized concerning this, when you're, when, as long as you have something, as long as, as long as you have something that's now a seed, if you have a seed, you can give it, and then it will come back onto you that God will increase and give it back. In fact, he makes a promises in the book of Genesis. He said, as long as this earth survives, he said, seed time, followed by harvest time will always come. In other words, if you sow it, it can't help itself. It will it come back as a harvest. It may not come back the next day or the next week, but it will come back. And God's got different ways of getting it to you. And the longer it takes to get to you, the bigger that amount is coming. Look at somebody say, whoopee-doo. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm telling you, you have got to plant it. Without a plant, there's no harvest. If you don't give, then you're not going anywhere. All you're doing is relying on your boss. All you're doing is relying, if you're on a pension, you're just relying on the gov government. If you're unemployed, you're relying on the government. Get off relying on the government. Take all that stuff that's rightfully yours, but learn how to sow it. Learn how to sow it into the kingdom and get into the heavenly bank system and watch how God brings it back to you. There's a multitude of scriptures in there to help you through. There's stories. One time Jesus, he was going to feed the, the 5,000 plus odd people up on that mountainside one day and, he said, and the, the disciples looked and said, how are you going to do this? And, and somebody brought a wee boy's lunch. The, the wee boy's, the wee boy's it's, it's in comparison to the need, it was nothing. A few, a few loaves and a few fishes, that's all it was. But he gave it to God. When you learn how to give God what you have, small or little, comparison to what's out there, where the need is out there, let me tell you something. He didn't realize what his small given. He opened a 5,000-seater restaurant on the hillside of, of, the, of, of that Middle Eastern place one day. Your money can make a difference and make a difference to you. You don't know how many business ideas is inside you. New idea, abundance, they'll never come to life because God can't trust you with them. But when he sees he can trust you with your giving, he'll give you new ideas. Why would God trust you with 10,000 when he can't trust you with 10 pounds? If you don't know how to give on 10, he'd never trust you with a 100 or a 1,000. What if he was to give you 10,000 in the morning? Would you give the tenth of that to, to the church or to a need? Would you give it to, if God was to give you 100,000? Oh, God, let me win the lottery. Why would he do that? Why would God trust you with a heap of money if you don't know how to give on the small portion that you have right now? So he tests you. And if you learn how to become a giver, according to the book of Genesis in chapter 29, Rachel, a little lady called Rachel, there she might one day, and there's these travelers coming down and they had camels with them. And she said, I'll give you drink for your camels. And uh, you got to understand what that meant that, that, that day. She was from a whale. She had to drop a bucket into a whale. They say that a camel drinks 15 gallons of water. And on the, according to the Bible that day, there was... Uh, there was a, a 15, drank 15, ca 15 gallons of, of water, but there was 10 camels. Now, it doesn't take a mathematician to work that. That's 150 gallons that this girl is going to have to draw out of a whale for to feed somebody else's, feed somebody else's uh, camels. That's a sacrifice. I don't know how long it's going to take, but she says, I'll do it. She didn't understand that the 10 camels that she's watering is in a matter of hours were carrying treasure that was going to become hers. You don't know when you start to sow into something, to bless something somewhere, somehow. You don't know how God will turn it all around until it comes back to you. Look at somebody say, I can hardly wait. I'm glad I took the offering first. We're glad we received the offering first because I don't want you ever thinking that Joe Corey's up there preaching for money. I'm not. If I was preaching for money, I would have held off the offering to the last and then took the, uh, took the offering. This is not the way I did it. I'm your pastor. I want to help you bless. I want you blessed. I want you to understand the biblical principles to get you from where you are out of the mold to where God wants you to be. Now, as long as you think I'm just trying to get your finances, then we're going to get nowhere. So 
if you can switch off that and understand this is kingdom. In fact, I never asked you about sowing to the church. I never mentioned that. I talked about sowing into somebody else's life or a missionary, a mission or somebody that's doing something in the kingdom or where God places on your heart. One day Jesus went into the temple. The Bible says he was watching people giving offerings. There was large sums of money been rolling into that offering table that day and the treasure. And a little woman came up and the Bible says she put in a couple of mites. It was next to nothing, absolutely next to nothing. And Jesus drew attention to it and he said, see that little lady? She's given more than the big boys down there give. And they kind of looked and said, wait a minute, you've got your mathematics wrong here. And he says, no, no, man. Here's the principle. It. It's not what you give in. It's what you give up to give in that makes the difference. What's going in doesn't really matter. It's what you've had to give up in order to give in. So people can give, but they've still got a heap left and it didn't really cost them anything in, that, in the first place. But when it costs you to give, when it puts you on a line to give in, let me tell you, your faith automatically starts to come in. You'll realize it's not a simple thing when you've just give your last or you've just gumped in something similar to that. You'll know then you're doing something in the kingdom of God and God will not let you down. And you'll un now you have your faith out and your belief for the increase to come back. I used to t uh, speak every year in America, at least once a year in a, in a Bible school called Christ for the Nations. Uh, and every day there's always a large lineup of, of international speakers who come. Uh, usually it was the cream of the crop was there. But they brought this one guy, uh, uh, he was an American, but he was in the mission fields of Mexico all his life. Wonderful, wonderful man. When, when I met him, he was in his 80s. And the last time I tried to meet him, he was in his 90s. But uh, uh, they always brought him to the Bible school to teach the Bible students about giving. And there was a great buzz in the, in, the, in the campus when he was coming. And they know he's not going to talk on righteousness or, or, or sharing the gospel even as a mission. He comes about money. And he's not coming for money for himself. He's coming to teach them about finances. And it, you know, in that Bible school, there's a lot of foreign uh, people comes in and they have hardly any money. You're meant to get your own support. Many of them don't have the support. They come from other nations. You can't work because you're in Bible school. And so they're just trusting God. And on that one day, it usually ends up the same. He'll ask, he'll, ask if he'll preach about, tell stories, fantastic stories about how he stayed alive and uh, with no support in the mission fields and how God turned up with the goods. It was always about what he gave and how God gave him back to fire the people up. And he would always nearly come to the last about halfway through the week on it, and he would tell them, he would say, start and pray and ask God to show you what one of your fellow classmates doesn't have the money to finish off their year. And then say, God, what do you want me to do about it? And it's the same every year. He said, by the time they finish that week, everybody's school fees is paid because people wants to give. As they give, then their parents are, just, says that nobody's going to give anywhere till they start to give, and then money comes back and they pay more people. And that not one time a year all the school fees get paid because they believe in sowing and reaping. Yeah, and, and I've met him over, the, well, I've listened to his teachings over the years. Fantastic about the stories he did. My heart goes out to that guy. And, 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 and then we came, the last time we was there just before COVID, so happened that he was, he was there the week before me. And I asked one of the Bible principals there, I said, is, is Wayne Myers still on campus? They said, he is, Joe. Is. I said, I've got to meet him. i really got to meet that man. I want to I wanna sit down and talk to him. In fact, my mind was this. i got money, and I'm going to give it to him. I just want to bless that man for all the things he's said, all the people he's helped over the years. So I got my money, and I had it in my pocket, and there was an arrangement made. Then I was to go up to the apartment that he was staying in, and the day that I went, he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He got another emergency call to go back to Mexico, and I never got to go. He's in his 90s now. But his, his, his goal in life was not to see how much he could earn. His goal in life was to see how much he could give in his lifetime. Give. Look at somebody say, I'd like to meet him myself. He ran on this scripture in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Wow. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He said there's a heavenly bank account. When you make a deposit down here, it's registering up there. 
God will get it back to you down here. But the, he said, I don't, he says, I must have millions stacked up waiting for me to go. Waiting, lay, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor corrupt, c- corruption can get it, where thieves do not break in and steal it. For where your treasure is, your heart is there also. Fantastic man. He saw signs, wonders, and miracles because his heart was pure before God. But his whole day was to see how much he could give away in his lifetime. So I, I, there's, there's times the Lord, now thankfully the Lord didn't do this too often, but there's times in our life that the Lord has asked Laura and I to give all. I didn't give it without going to Laura and say, we need to do this. Nor did she ever do it without coming and say to me, look, uh, uh, I'm ju- I've just given it all away, Joe. Because <laughs> that causes a riot. Look at somebody say, you're right. <laughs> so, when, uh, so when we get this in our spirit, we'll usually sit down and say. And then and uh, normally we don't fight it through. We'll just turn around and say, well, if you think it's God, then we'll do it. But on several occasions, this has happened. And I think I told you this before, but there's people out there that's never heard this story. But we were in uh, uh, America one time, in the southern parts of America. Uh, we were uh, invited over to a conference. I wasn't speaking. We were just being ministered to. Uh, and they, they, the leader of it said, we got somebody you can stay with. So we were staying with this wonderful couple. They picked us up in the, in the airport, and they took us to their house, and they were, uh, were talking. But we noticed what from from we got there, there was a great sadness. We, we, we were only in, and we didn't know him, so we didn't want to say anything, you know. So we were getting ready to go to the first night of the conference there, and, and uh, 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 he, the man says, we'll drive you down, but we can't go. And I could see the lady, she was sitting with her hanky out, and her eyes was red, and I said, Lim, look, is there something wrong? And they didn't want to tell us. We took a little bit of time to talk to them. They said, well, yes, there is. They said, it's our daughter. I said, what's wrong with your daughter? She said, she's been arrested. They said, we have a curfew, curfew here. You've got to be in by a certain time. And they said, she wasn't in at a certain time. And she said, I'll be honest with you, she's a little bit, she was a bit rebellious and there's a bit of drink on her. And in this, the laws there is very strict. And they said, they've arrested her. And, uh, uh, and, and I said, is she underage? She says, well, she's just over the age. But she says they've thrown her in to the jail uh, for to stay there until bail is paid. And they said she's in there with all types of people. Uh, uh, and the, the lady, she can hardly console herself with, with this talk. And I said, well, can you go and get her out? And they said, we don't have the money to get her out. And I said, well, how much does it take to get her out? And, and so we looked at us, they weren't going to tell us. But eventually after coercion, I said, oh, how much is it to get her out of jail? And they said, well, there's a bail bond. You've got to do this. And he told us how much it was. And he kind of one of them statements, is, you sucker, air, you know. <laughs> you know when you heard. <coughs> but uh, anyway, I looked at Laura. Laura looked at me. And I said, I, I need to talk him. And so when Laura and I went into another room. I said, how much have we got? And it turns out that what we had was sufficient to pay the bail bond. It was sufficient to pay it, but basically left us with nothing, sitting in America with nothing. Uh, we knew the people that were with us would feed us. We knew the next place we're going to us would feed us, but with nothing, absolutely nothing. But at the time of this, we had the money, and there's a girl in jail, and we had the opportunity to get her out of jail. So we said to the, to the mom and dad, said, here's a deal. I said, if you'll go down to the sheriff and bring us down with you, and if you'll give us 10 minutes alone with your daughter, we don't want you in there, just Laura and I. With your, if you give us 10 minutes with your daughter in there, we'll give you the money to get her out of jail. And so they said, okay, and we went down, and the sheriff let us in, and we went into the jail. We met this, met this young girl for the first time. And so Laura sat on one side of her, and I sat on the other. And we didn't condemn her and didn't tell her we were paying you to get you out. No, 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 we just talked about her. And then we talked to her about Jesus and how God loves her and forgives us. And down the path you're going, we'll take you here, but we can get you out. And let me tell you something, in that jail cell, that young girl gave her life to Jesus Christ. She didn't know we were going to pay her out. She didn't know it. But right in that jail cell, she gave her, she got born again in that jail cell. And then we said, we'd be back in 10 minutes. We handed over the money and we got her out of jail, but we were sitting broke. <laughs> and I remember going to the conference, and as you know, you've been with me long enough, I like coffee. I like the smell of coffee. And this large conference church had a coffee shop just gone through the door. So when you went through, ooh, the aroma, the aroma of the bean, the roasted bean would catch your nostril. And all of a sudden you say, we've got to have a coffee. But I didn't even have money for a coffee. Laura had no money for a coffee and I had no money for a coffee. 
But we didn't complain because we had sowed it as a seed and a good thing. We knew God would turn up somewhere somehow. But nothing turned up somehow, somehow for the next three days at the conference and I had to do without my coffee. <laughs> and anyway, we went to the next place and somebody else took us to the next place and we were at the next place and, 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 and they kept us alive. They were feeding us and we were having great fun. Never talked about what we did and how we did it. But nothing extra came. It was, it was on the second time we moved to another place and we were up there and then a man said, uh, your next journey you're going, we can't take you there. We'll take you halfway. Can you arrange with somebody else? I said, just get us there. Just get us halfway there. So it was, the it was like the middle of the night. They took us to this massive car park in the middle of nowhere and dropped us off there. They said, are you sure you'll get somebody? I said, somebody will come for us. And we're standing, do you remember that, Laura? We're standing in a Walmart car park in the middle of the dark. And it's a dangerous place to be, but there's nobody about. And we're standing, the next thing, these headlights come blazing up, and it was a fella in a Jeep. And I looked at Laura, and I learned, and I said, I hope we're going to get out of this one alive. And the Jeep came up real fast, like, really fast. Just pulled right out in front of the passenger door open. He says, Joe Coy. I said, that would be me. He jumped out. He says, I have tracked you for days. And every time I go here, you're over there. And when you get here, you're over there. And I said, what are you looking for? He says, Lord told me to give you this. And he pulled a large bag of finances. I, I said, this doesn't look good. In the middle of the night in a Walmart car park, and there's money being handed off with a guy and a big beard, big bully fella with a, in a Jeep. I said, this doesn't look good but I said can you take me there he said that's why I'm here he says the Lord specifically spoke and he says get this to Joe Cora and so the money came look at somebody say the money came we have seen God turned up so many times on things like that because I've always targeted my finances. I've always had a reason to give. I was always blessing somebody or somewhere I needed to go. And there was another one of them journeys one night I needed to take, didn't have the money. But I went to a meeting in North Belfast. And it was a time when North Belfast was not the place to be, if you know what I'm saying. For the people who doesn't know what I'm saying, we know what we're talking about. And I know I was coming out late at night, and it's come as happy because we did this meeting. It was a great meeting. I was coming out, I get into the car, I was about to drive up, and a car came screaming. I'm talking about screaming around the corner, and you kind of get wide eyed and think, oh no. And the car done almost like a handbrake turn and slammed right, right across my pathway that I couldn't move. All I could say was, Jesus, help me. And a man came out, I thought I'm going to be kidnapped or something. <coughs> and a man came out of the car, I knew it was okay when I saw that he was wearing slippers. Because there's nobody, nobody kidnaps you wearing slippers. Not even in them days. Not even in them days they didn't do it. They may have carried a club, but they didn't wear slippers. But I knew it was safe when I saw the, the slippers. And he came up, and I recognized him. And I, went, I said, what are you doing scaring the living daylights out of me? And he put his hand inside, and he pulled out an orange envelope. He said, Joe, Joe Corey, I don't know what you're up to. <laughs> he said, I don't know where you're going, what you're doing. He says, but I was in prayer in my prayer room. And he said, the Lord spoke to me loud and clear. He says, get that to Joe Coy and get it to him now. And I said, look, sure, you, I, I can get it to him. He says, get it to him now. I said, I saw the urgency in which you arrived. <laughs> I've seen this so many times. If you learn how to give, if you learn how to trust if you learn how to listen to the Lord when he says, go, give. In fact, the biggest thing that you ever need to know from this point on is how much and where. Now, I never told you to give to me, and I never told you to give to the church. You need to understand this about your life. He'll ask you to give to people. He'll ask you to give to things. Forget about me. Forget about the church. This is not about Titan. This is about your life and success. If you want your finances to operate for you, start listening to him. Start give where he tells you to give. How much and where is all you need to go? Principle number one ends right there. Let me give you a second one. It is the, the first is the money, the, the giving I do. Second is the people I've met. You have, write this down. This will help you. This is where you're going. Somebody, somewhere holds the key to the next step, next level for you and God. Somebody, somewhere has it. There's somebody you're going to meet will tell you how to do it, where to go. They've already done it. will show you the way. There's somebody out there that you need to meet. Everything in the kingdom of God is based on relationships. D ministry should be. It's, over the years, it's not. People just go to somewhere because somebody asked them. That's not how this works. 
It never was. It's always on relationships. God puts you in relationship with people. So you accept invitations or go to meetings because God wants you to connect over here in a new relationship. When you've got relationships, everybody needs relationships. And when God wants to do something with you, then you have to bring a relationship into your life. In fact, your prayer life will basically go nowhere until you get involved with people. Sitting behind closed doors. And let me tell you, working from home was the worst thing could ever happen to anybody, even during COVID, because people cut themselves off. You need people. People are your life source. People is your ministry. You're not born uh, called of God to sit behind a wall somewhere and pray 48 hours a day. It's all about people. You've got to be a people lover. And lover is relationships. Relationships are connected to your destiny. In fact, relationships are connected to, they're like stepping stones to where God needs you to be. For God to take you from where you are to where he needs you to be, there's somebody who you need to meet. There's somebody right now that's watching you. So, this is why you've got to be careful what you say. You can't rival Laura. Sometimes I'd go to rival Laura, would be saying something, and I'd say to her, she'd say, you never know who's watching. <laughs> And sometimes you say, you know that man walked past you? He might just come to our church next Sunday. And you're only after saying that to me. So, you, so I'll take that look at somebody and say, Laura has a lot of wisdom. <coughs> you never know who's watching. I'm talking about it in a good sense. You never know who's watching. You never know who knows. You just never know. Because if you're born to impact lives, while you're impacting this, somebody else is watching and waiting on their turn. Somebody will do what you're doing because you're a born leader and you're, you're meant to impact people. Well, let me say it again. When God goes to move you to the next level, it's because he has a contact for you to get out there. Somebody will show you the way. When David, who was just a shepherd boy, had to be king, how's God going to get David from the fields up till into the palace? It's really easy. The man that was on the throne was called Saul, and Saul is heavily depressed and at one point suicidal. He would have these suicidal tendencies come onto his life. And he even said to the servants one day, what am I going to do? And as one of his servants said, you need music. You need music. You need to learn how to put music on. In them days, they didn't have uh, Alexa. And they didn't. See, when I spoke that word, the Alexa come on all over Ireland right there. <laughs> she listens to you. But, but uh, uh, they didn't have the, the internet and, and uh, uh, so far. So what do you call that? They have so, so Spotify. Spotify. They didn't have all that type of stuff back in them days. They just had people who could play. And as anointed man, and he's just a shepherd boy. And one man turned around and said, you need music. When music is played, your depression will leave. When anointed music is played, your demons will leave you. And then he said, I know a man. I've heard him. You don't know who's listening to you. You don't know who heard you. And let me tell you, that one man saying, but I know where there's a guy, give David an invitation to come up into the palace. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep speaking nice. Keep praying publicly for people. And let me tell you, God will make a way. I'll give you number three and number four without hardly, without hardly taking a breath, just to finish it for you as soon as you have them. But number three was the expectation of my heart. I have an expectation, second to none. I really expect God to do it. I believe God. Does anybody here believe God? I, I, believe, I believe God can. Not only can, but God wants to. I really, really, really believe God wants to do it. I believe good things is going to happen. I believe if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. And if it's going to happen here, it's going to happen to me. Look at somebody say, me too, me too. I have this expectation. I may not have what I need right now, but don't go away because something's on its way. It could be coming on a FedEx. It could be coming on UPS. Something good's coming. It could be coming on PayPal. Look at somebody say, do you want my PayPal number? It could, it could be coming through the post in the morning. Something good is going to happen to me. Everybody shout, something good's going to happen to me. You've got to believe it. You've got to have faith. I remember when my brother-in-law and my sister came back from Africa with tales of signs, wonders, and miracles. I remember back then, I was naive, but I asked them, I said, how come all that happens in Africa and nothing ever happens in Ireland? How come all them miracles and blind eyes open on the spot? And he looked at me and he said, it's real easy. I can answer that. I said, what? He says, because the people expect it. They have an expectation in Africa that they don't have in Ireland. 
I thought to myself, I need to get my expectation moved up another level. Job had expectation, even though he was hit right, left, and center and lost everything. And here's what he said, I know my Redeemer lives. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this mess, and I don't know what it'll take, but I know God is with me. He will not let me down. He will make a way where there is no way. In other words, if God done it before, he can do it again. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says, For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that that I have committed unto him to this day. I know it. I know every penny, every cent, every coin that I've ever given. I know it has went to certain heaven. And God has already given me back in abundance. But I've given again and again and again. So there's more. Look at somebody say there's more. Here's the last one. Number four is the opportunities I took. As long as you sit in your small circle and miss every opportunity and refuse to go, you'll never know what life is. And God can't get to you. And he can't open a door. Opportunities are the doorway to your destiny. When David uh, was, was heard about that Goliath, he went down there and that giant is on the hill. Look, nobody else in the whole nation was going to tackle him. Not a single one. All the fighting men in Israel were sitting at home eating their cornflakes. Nobody would fight Goliath. Not a single one. And, but this young fellow, he turned around and said, I'll do it. I have something inside me that says, I'll do it. Put me down for that. I'll go. I don't know where I'll get the money, but I'll go. I don't know where I'll stay. But some, sometimes the army has had to sleep in the most awkward situations, places that normal human beings should never have to live in and sleep in. But we've had to do it just to get there, to minister to somebody else, to bring another blessing, to bring the Word of God. Sometimes years ago, I had to almost sleep in the car to get from where I was going to the next one, to get a little sleep so as we could be where God wants. Because we have this urgency on the inside of us and an expectation to take the opportunities God gives us and we say, we'll do it. We'll do it. Put us down. People say, well, it's never been done before. Doesn't matter. We'll do it. Well, I tell you, you'll not get paid for it. Doesn't matter. We'll do it. God will pay us. Somebody has to do it and it might as well be me. It's an, every, every occasion that comes is an opportunity to trust God. Another opportunity to see God in action. And when David said, I'll do it and take on Goliath, nobody else would do it. That one act got his name written in the pages of a holy Bible. That one, yes, I'll do it, took him from insignificance into a place of fame overnight. And I'm closing. Years and years ago at the beginning of our ministry. Sometimes I think back to the beginning of our ministry. When we know, knew very little, what would a heart bigger than ourselves? We'd go anywhere, do anything. And I remember a man, I, I, was, I was a youth leader, but we weren't, uh, we weren't pastoring anything at the time. And a man from up country up there came and he said, said I need somebody to take a minibus to, to uh, a place called Falkirk in Scotland. I'd never even heard of Fal Falkirk in Scotland. But he said, he said I, I need a man to take a, a, a minibus to Falkirk in Scotland. He says, the Salvation Army over there needs a minibus. He says, I so happen to have one, uh, but I have no drive. I have nobody to take it over to the Salvation Army. I said, look no further. Me and my good lady wife will go. And our children. <laughs> well, it's a minibus. You get a whole bunch of people in there, you know. I said, we'll go. He said, there's a problem now. I said, what would that be? He says, left-hand drive. The car was a European car. It was a left all right, you know what I'm saying? So it's not going to be easy just driven. It doesn't matter. Doesn't, I could drive anything. Let me in. <laughs> he says, well, he says, okay. I tell you the truth, the thing, the, the thing was a bit of a ramshackle held together with duct tape and welt and iron. You know what I'm you know turning around and saying? Frank, if I told you the man who sent us, you would know exactly the type of the van would give us. Anyway, we took the van and we took the ferry across the continent. We drove up to Scotland and we prayed and rejoiced and sung all the way up there and we got there. Uh, I, I took it to the Salvation Army man and the Salvation Army man says, you'll, you'll come to the church on Sunday. We want the people to see who drove the van. And he says, when you're here, you'll give your testimony. Not, would you like to, but you will give your testimony to the people. And I thought, you don't know my testimony because I'm a Holy Ghost filled man and I'm on fire on the inside. Uh, and so I decided I'd tell him, I said, I said, my testimony of the blood of Jesus is right. I said, but uh, I've seen extraordinary things. He said, we need to hear about that, son. We need to hear about that. And so uh, on the morning fellowship, I was in another church first. 
then they were going to take us over to the second one. But the head man, the captain of the Salvation Army came in. And I got up and told them what to seen God doing and believe what God can do. And after it, the Salvation Army man says, you're the right fella for us. He says, come, he says, when you come there the night, there's going to be a man. He's going to sit in the second row back. He says, years ago, he was a big rugby player, massive man. He said, he's not like that now. He said he's just hunched over, thin, and that, that. I said, what's wrong? He says he suffers from severe, severe depression. In fact, he says his mother sits with him and cries all the time because he commit, tries to commit suicide on a regular basis. They said, no matter what we give him, they can't get it stopped. I said, Jesus will stop it. Jesus will turn this around. And he, and, and, and he said to me, he says, we've got other people like that in the congregation. I said, well, Jesus is the man you need. And, the, and, and we did that in church and we went up to the Salvation Army and, and God blessed the man, but he took a chance on us. And he said, there's a man here from Northern Ireland who drove the bus to give to him with all clapped and cheered and said, come and tell us, Joe, your testimony. We just told him a simple testimony. And then I made an appeal. I wasn't going to grab, I saw him sitting there, but I wasn't just going to dive on him, you know. I wanted to, but I thought, no, let it go. So I, I, I told him what God can do and what I'd seen God do. And I said, is there anybody in here First of all, a big plan of salvation. Then it says, anybody in here and you need God to grant a miracle to you tonight? Well, nobody moved. But I had him in my sights. So I waited and I said, God can deliver you from anything. Just give him one chance. Just one more shot if you do it. And the man stood to his feet. He was, that means in salvation, army, they're not used to doing this. That one man, that one man stood to his feet. I remember looking at him, he was bent over. And I, I didn't waste another second. I went straight down there and laid hands on him and I commanded that spirit of suicide and depression to leave him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That man straightened in a second of time. He just shot straight up, put his shoulders back like a new man, like a, like a, like a strike of lightning that hit him on the inside. And he straightened himself up and he looked at me with tears running down his face. And he says, for years I've been held in darkness. He says, but I don't know what you've done. But he says, that darkness just left me. I feel different. His mother got up and hugged him. He hugged everybody. There's no use trying to have church after that. Now you've got total chaos on the rest of it. And, and, and then another man from the yard said, he can run up. He says, pray for me now. And another woman came up and said, pray for me now. Let me tell you, what have never said yes to take the minibus to Scotland, then we never would have seen the miracles that was to ensue. I would tell you just after that, then miracle ministry began to enhance and increase and enlarge throughout when, when we had traveled throughout Ireland. Sometimes you've got to take the small opportunities, the opportunities that doesn't really look like anything, but behind it, big, big places open on small doors, and you've got to say yes. As long as you sit where you are, you'll never see God. And God cons consistently will bring opportunities to you to go. So it's the given I did. It's, it, was, it was the people I met. It was the expectation of my heart. And above all this was the opportunities that I took. Remember them and put them into operation. And whatever he does next, you do it. Learn how to be a giver and bless people and, and look for, look for, I tell you, all I want you is to be happy. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be increased. I want you to see God in action. I want, I want you to be, come alive on the inside and be the best there is out there for somebody needs you. God needs you. God wants to move through you in the most majestic way. This is your time. This is your season. Go for it. Absolutely go for it. Some of you, all you read right now is new contacts. Put your hand up if you need contact. Who is it in this building that needs the contact? Somebody's holding your next, somebody's holding a doorway. Somebody's holding an, uh, an invite. It's through a contact. It's going to come. I pray right now. Contact, Holy Ghost contact come to you in Jesus' name. Someone will bring job opportunities. Someone will bring an invite to another nation. Someone will be an invite for a cup of tea somewhere that will open the door to somebody else. I want to tell you something. Contact, we're believing right now. If you're believing with me for fresh opportunities, new contacts to come so that you can be in the place you need to be in Jesus' name. God is going to do it. I, 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 he got out. Did he take, is he uh, Tyler to go to work? He got out before and he did to say that. But you tell him, you tell him that new contact is coming to him that will great, bring great increase with them. 
and they look at them and think, why are they coming to me? They could have went to there, there, and there, but God will see to it that they'll bypass the others because they've watched the integrity of heart. They have seen they can trust this man. They couldn't have done it a year ago, but they watched to see if they could trust him. They watched to see if he wasn't a con man, and because now they've made a decision, contacts are coming that will set him in a great place. There's no need to hold back. It's time full throttle full throttle. God's about to bring blessings and places and things through him and to him in Jesus' name. All right, who needs the opportunities? Just two people need. We got three people. Is that all? My goodness me. <sighs> Thought is in a free pea church there this morning. Let's go. Who needs the opportunities? That's better. Father, there's people here and we need opportunities. I know what it's like because I meet new people all the time. I hear people. I get invited. People want to talk. To, I, I know what it's like. But years ago, it wasn't like that. But then opportunities came. Now, Father, we're going to believe that th this is holiday season anyway. It's easy to go at a, at a, a new place, a new adventure. We believe for opportunities now. Opportunity knocks. We believe now for opportunities to come to these people so that they can be and have and do. We believe that right now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, these people are ready to give. They're ready to give. I'm not putting the offering basket around lest they say this. I'm looking money. But there's people out there that has needs. There's people out there that is, need school uniforms. There's all types of stuff. There's always needs. I pray that you put a need in front of these people so that they can be a major blessing to somebody else. So when they see they're given, then it'll come back to them and they'll agree that it works. Once they agree it works, my Father, there'll be no stopping them. You can seriously, seriously increase them. I pray right now in Jesus' name for those people who's got grandchildren or you've got sons or daughters and the young ones is coming up and they're going to go to school uniform school uniforms are a fortune. So I believe with you right now that the money will come for your children to have the best. They won't have to run around and hand me downs, but they'll have the best because, because the increase of God will see to it in Jesus' name. This young lady, this is going to be a great year for you. This is going to be a good year. This is going to be a year when you're going to meet new contacts. Relationships is coming into your life this time that won't backstab, won't treat, won't treat, won't do you harm, but they'll do you good. Now, you've got to make choices, but there's new relationships and there's new contacts that will, some of them will stay with you for the rest of your days. Opportunities are coming for you to see things and do things and go places that you've not come before. In other words, God is set in your future. This, this incoming year, especially when you go, you go back to school, well, you've no other choice. <laughs> but let me tell you, this, this year's not going to be like any other year. You'll hear things, you'll see things, you'll meet people that will put a fire on the inside of you, and you'll keep writing down in your little journal, i got to go there. i got to see that for myself. Looky here. And opportunities will come. Start writing them down. Start writing them down. The, uh, I'm pointing to you, little one. The opportunities are coming to you that you'll read it and you'll see that and you'll hear it and you'll look at it on YouTube and you'll look in different places and say, Mommy, can we go there one day? And she'll say, mm, uh, one day, one day, when your daddy's ready, one day. Let me tell you something. Put down the one day and say, I'm going there. I'm going. Now, don't go on your own, but start making your list of so places you need to go and things you need to do and opportunities will come to you. At your age, you can now see God in operation. God is going to do the most dramatic things in and through your life. This is your season. This is your this is your time. Don't don't cut God out of the equation. Talking to the whole Kilkeel sector here. I don't know if you all live in that direction, but you know the nickname you've got now. Okay, you and your household. Let me tell you, don't cut God out of the equation. The longer it takes for a blessing to come, it means there's more compensation coming in the inside. If you've had to wait for something, God compensates you for the wait. He just doesn't increase you. He incre increases you with compensation. Whatever you believe has been stole for you. Just give it. Say, Father, I'll argue with it no more. I'll tell you what, I give it. I'm not even going to count how much it was because that's a lot of stuff. But I give it to you as a seed. And once it's in as a seed, it will begin to germinate. It will begin to increase and multiply. And a major harvest will come to you. He says, I have more in store for you than you can ever imagine. Those things that's been a hindrance to you will shortly not be a hindrance to you at all. In fact, you look and say, that was an experience. But I can help other people now through that experience in life. This is a new season. This is a new time. God will not let you down in Jesus' name. Let's stand up feet and we will close the meeting this morning.
We need to let you go on your holiday as Father. We thank you for this glorious time. Thank you for knowledge, information. We thank you for making us feel good, churning something in the inside, adding something to us. We thank you as we step out through there, we're stepping into life, into our destiny. Life will work for us. We leave behind the drudge and the and the fighting and the arguing, and we're going over the wall. We're going to believe life will be. This is going to be a good week for us now in Jesus' name. Amen.